Hi everyone and welcome back to a new episode of Diagnose Dan. Today we are working on a 2010 Volkswagen Tiguan and the customer complaint is that the car is overheating because the cooling fans are not working. So let's diagnose this together. In this video, I'll be using the Autel IM608. Now, most of you know the IM608 as one of the best locksmith tools in the world. But did you know it's also a very high-end scan tool? In this video, we'll be using both sides of the tool. We're gonna use the diagnostic side of it to diagnose this car, and later on in the video, we're gonna try and program some keys with it. If you wanna learn more about this tool, there's a link in the description box of this video. Now before we continue, a little bit of background information. This car was brought to me by another shop yesterday and they told me this car started overheating about three weeks ago. When the car came into their shop the first time, they replaced a coolant temperature sensor and they told me after that, the car was fine for a week. But after that week, the car came back with exactly the same symptoms. Then they realized that the cooling fans were not working. Not when the engine was hot and not when you turned on the AC. They diagnosed the system, took some measurements and they finally decided to replace the entire cooling fan assembly. Now this is the old unit and they replaced it with a brand new one. But guess what? The fans are still not working. So they asked me Dan, will you have a look? And to be honest, I took a quick look at this car yesterday and I kind of know what's wrong with it. Then I realized, hey, the other shop took all the right steps. They took all the right measurements, but still they misdiagnosed the car. So in this video, I wanna take you through those steps, show you what mistake they made, and hopefully we can get these fans running again. We're going to start out by confirming the customer complaint. I'm gonna use the scan tool to command the cooling fans on. And if that doesn't work, we're going to see if there are any relevant fault codes stored regarding those cooling fans. As I was hooking up the Bluetooth dongle to the car, I realized I forgot to tell something important about the IM608. The IM608 is not only a very good locksmith tool to program keys and a very high-end scan tool, but the Bluetooth dongle is also a J-Box. That means that this device can be used as an interface or pass-through between you and the manufacturer to download the latest software on your vehicle. Now these are the bi-directional controls for the cooling fan circuit. When I press activate, the cooling fans should come on. Now, as you could see, the cooling fans did not turn on. Now, let's see if there are any fault codes stored regarding those cooling fans. And we've got a fault code stored, the PO480 cooling fan control circuit. Now, as you could see, those fans did not turn on. So that's customer complaint confirmed. Now, we also had a fault code stored for the cooling fan circuit. Now, the cooling fan circuit, in this case, are only four wires. So there's only four wires we need to check. There's a big power feed, a big ground wire, a communication wire, because one of the two fans, this one, is actually a control module that can talk to the engine computer. And the other small wire, I believe, is a power feed for that module. But before we look into a wiring diagram, let's check the obvious. Let's check that big power and that big ground wire, because without a proper power and ground, those fans are never gonna work. We're underneath the car and this is the new cooling fan assembly and this is the connector. Now I can see somebody has been measuring over here because some of the wires appear to be pierced. Now I don't recommend piercing the wires but it does confirm that they did the right checks. Now they told me that the power and ground to the fans are fine so we are going to redo the test and see if we get the same results. But instead of piercing the wires we are going to back probe them. Thank you. 
In the next step, we're going to confirm that power and ground wire using a multimeter. I'm gonna hook up the negative lead to the ground wire and that positive lead to the power feed. And when we turn on the multimeter, of course, we should see 12 volts. So that's power and ground confirmed, right? Right? Or did we just make a huge mistake? Did we make a mistake? Well, let's find out. We're gonna redo the measurement, but this time we're gonna use a digital LED style test light. When I hook up this test light to battery negative and it finds a positive, the test light will light up red and it will give us the voltage. When I connect it to battery positive and it finds a ground, the test light will light up green and again give us the voltage. So right now I've got the test light hooked up to battery negative. So when I touch the positive wire, the test light should light up red and give us a voltage. And I hope you can see that, but it does light up red and it gives us 12.3 uh, volts. Now I'm gonna relocate um, my test light from battery negative to battery positive. There we go. And now, when I touch the ground wire, the test light should light up green. So let's touch that ground wire, and indeed, it does light up green, and it gives us 12.2 volts. Now we have confirmed twice that we've got a good power and a good ground. We use two different tools, so our test is extra reliable. Or is it? We're gonna do this test a third and final time, but this time we're gonna use an incandescent test light. Now incandescent means a test light with an actual light bulb. So no displays, no LEDs, an actual light bulb. Now the light bulb inside this test light is red, but it is a light bulb. Now we're gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna hook this side up to battery negative and when I touch the power feed, the test light should light up. Now it doesn't change color because there are no electronics inside this test light. Now after that, we're gonna do the same test, but this time I'm gonna hook it up to battery positive. And when I touch the ground wire, again, the test light should light up. Let me see, hooking it up to battery negative. Oops, I hope this cord is long enough. So when I touch the power feed, the test light should light up. And it does. As you can see, the test light lights up. So now, I'm gonna switch my test light from battery negative to battery positive. And now, when I touch the ground wire, Again, the test light should light up. So touching the ground wire, and it should light up, but it doesn't. Now let me try to explain. Right now, I've got the multimeter hooked up to the positive and negative wire again, and we are reading 12.3 volts, indicating there is a voltage present at those terminals. Now this is the test light that's connected to battery positive. So when I touch that ground wire, the test light should light up. But watch what happens when I touch that ground wire. My test light does not light up and the voltage on the multimeter drops. Now what the auto shop did wrong is they measured the power and ground using a multimeter or an LED style test light. Now those tools are not the right tools to measure a power or a ground because you do check if there's voltage present, but you don't load the circuit. You don't check if the wire can carry current. That's why you always need to use an incandescent bulb style test light because that little light needs current flow to light up. Now on the ground wire, the test light did not light up. So on the ground wire, there's high resistance. Now to check whether the high resistance in the ground wire is our only problem, in the next step, 
I want to install a jumper wire and temporarily restore the ground wire. Then we're going to use the scan tool to command the fans on again. And if they do turn on, the only thing that's left to do is find the resistance. As you can see, with the jumper wire installed, the fans worked perfectly again. Now, before I started shooting this video, I knew we had a ground problem because I quickly tested it yesterday, but I didn't know what was causing it. So off camera, I had a quick look and I found some suspicious ground wires just behind the left headlamp. So I removed the headlamp and removed the air filter housing. And let me show you what I found there. When the headlight was still in the car, I could just see these three ground wires. Now let me zoom you guys in on them to show you why they caught my attention. What I could see is that those three wires had been very hot. A part of the insulation has melted and when I removed the headlight and wiggled the wires, I realized we have a loose connection. Now, although it's highly likely I still cannot be 100% sure that one of those ground wires is actually for the cooling fan because I still have not looked at a wiring diagram, but when I saw those ground wires, I figured they needed my attention anyway. Now, to be sure that one of those wires is actually for the cooling fan, we're gonna do a test. I took a light bulb, and this one is actually a little bit heavier than the one in my test light, and that's no problem because these cooling fans draw quite a lot of current. Now, what I wanna do is stick this light bulb in the positive and negative terminal in the connector and when I wiggle the ground wires we hope to see or we should see this light bulb light up. So let me stick it in there gently gently stick it in there and I'm gonna wiggle it and you guys watch the test light and when it lights up we know we're on the right track. Now we know that those ground wires, or at least one of them, is for the cooling fan. And when we fix it, we have fixed our cooling fan issue. It does make you wonder what the other two ground wires are for, because as far as I know, there are no other complaints, or at least I haven't been asked to look at any. But I'm pretty sure when we fix those ground connections, we fix more than just a cooling fan problem.
Everything is reassembled. I'm gonna start the car, turn on the AC, while you guys have a look if the fans kick in. As you could see, the fans came on, I cleared the codes, they didn't come back, this car is fixed. I'm gonna advise the other shop to seal up the puncture holes they made, and I'm gonna leave it up to them if they wanna leave the repair as it is, or if they wanna replace the ground wires. I was only asked to diagnose the car. Now, when it comes to diagnostics and bi-directional controls, the IM608 passed the test. But let's find out how good it is when it comes to programming keys. This is a 2014 Outlander PHEV, and this car uses a smart key. Now normally, from the dealer, this key is about 200 euros. And what I did, just out of curiosity, is order a cheap aftermarket Chinese key from Wish, and this key was only 25 euros. Now the big question is, if it's that cheap, will it actually work, and is the IM608 capable of programming it? This is the original key, and this is the aftermarket key. Now they look very similar, only on the aftermarket key, the logo is missing. Now obviously, this one works, and this one does not. Now obviously, with the aftermarket key, it hasn't been programmed yet. When I push the start button, it tells me that the key is not detected. Now let me get the original key. And with the original key, the ignition turns on. So this is the original key, and that one's working. And this one is the aftermarket key that obviously still needs to be programmed. Now, I already ID'd the car, and we're going to smart key learning. We can also do all keys lost, but since we still got a functioning key, that's not necessary. <clears throat> so let's click OK, and it tells you to close all the doors. I latch that door, and I close this one. So let's continue, and it tells me to put a learned key into the key slot. OK. Turn the ignition on. We did. And it's communicating with the car right now. It might take a while. Turn the ignition off. Okay. And it turned the ignition on again by its own. Learning succeeded. Would you like to learn the next one? Enter, enter the new key into the key slot. Yes. And it's communicating again. And I hear a beep. And it tells me learning succeeded. Would you like to learn another key? No. Learning is completed. Now it tells me that the key learning is completed. But will it actually work? Let's start out with the aftermarket key. And at least the remote works. And the original key also still works, but will the aftermarket key turn the ignition on? In order to do that, I need to get the original key out of the car. 
So I'll put that away. And now, the moment of truth. Will it turn on the ignition? <laughs> it actually worked. Now there's your question answered. Will a cheap key I bought from Wiz work? Well, in this case, it certainly did. Now I don't know about the quality or how long it's gonna last, but this car only came with one key and the aftermarket key is gonna serve as a spare key. Now I guess a 25 euro spare smart key is not a bad deal. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you got any technical questions or if you wanna discuss something you saw in one of my videos, please consider joining the Diagnose Dan Global Tech Support Group on Facebook and help each other out. If you wanna learn more, subscribe to my channel and when you hit the little bell, you will get a notification each time I post a new video. And remember, Diagnose Dan, fix it again. See you next time, guys. Now let me try to explain. I've got the multimeter hooked up again to the positive and negative wire. And we are reading 12.3 volts, indicating we've got a good voltage. Now this is my test light that is hooked up to battery positive. So when I tit when I tit when I tit the ground wire, 